Hello everyone and welcome to Lyson of Denmark and especially welcome to you Jonathan Gray from New Zealand. It's nice to have you with us today. It's my pleasure to be with you Eva. Yeah and for those who many of you have uh, uh, seen uh, Jonathan's uh, videos on archaeology, you have read his books and uh, he has been very many places and uh, had seminars about archaeology and uh, so we are looking forward for you to share many of your experience today. So, uh, but uh, before we uh, let you start to talk, let's invite the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can connect here with uh, Jonathan in New Zealand. And uh, we are so grateful for the way you have been guiding him. We thank you for uh, the Bible is saying that uh, if we don't uh, preach, the stones will preach. And we know that the archaeology will help many people to believe that the Bible is true. And there is so much to learn from all these archaeological findings. We pray that you will uh, bless now as uh, Jonathan is going to share his testimony, what you have been doing in his life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jonathan, um, can you please just tell a little bit about yourself and your childhood? Did you grow up in a Christian home? Just uh, yeah, share a little bit with us. Yes, well, uh, my ancestry is partly French, partly Scottish, and partly British. And uh, my grandfather uh, came from uh, Britain uh, to migrate out to Australia and on the way out on the boat, because way back in the early days when there was no plane travel, it was all by boat. And on the way on the boat, uh, my grandmother took ill and died, and she had to be buried across uh, in the water, actually in the Red Sea. Wow. And uh, so he, the, my grandfather came to Australia with his uh, uh, five children, and uh, he married a woman who turned out to be a witch. Mm. Bewitched by the witch. Wow, so you come from and, a witch family. That, so, that sounds uh, terrible, Jonathan. <laughs> but yeah, yes. continue. And so anyway, uh, she turned his mind in that direction. And uh, she did not like the children. So uh, one morning she was chasing uh, the one of the children around the to, to smack him, to hit him. And the, my grandfather came into the room and the grandmother said, look, this child is, is trying to chase me and hurt me. We don't want these children in the house. Put them in an orphanage. 
Hmm. And so the five children went to an orphanage. Hmm. And uh, my, my grandfather was a doctor, a medical doctor, and he began to use spiritualism. As my father grew up in the orphanage and eventually came out, my grandfather said to him, I want you to come into medical practice with me using spiritism. Hmm. And I had to uh, something about Jesus in the orphanage and he said no I do not want to do that so grandfather said to him all right for the rest of your life you are going to be chased and haunted by the spirits well my father went to a farm in New South Wales Australia and he was riding a horse uh, as they were round up the cows and suddenly two hands put themselves around his waist and lifted him off the horse and started throwing him over the cliff and then my father suddenly another different pair of hands hold on to him put him right back on the horse and he knew this was a spiritual battle he was involved in and uh, then, as he married my mother, they moved to New Zealand. And uh, they were, uh, my father was um, talking about his background. And uh, one night, the moon was full. He was asleep. And my mother was uh, lying in bed. And she heard the sound of bottles glass bottles it was like somebody was walking on the street outside the house bottles were shaking on the back in a bag and the sound stopped at the gate the gate opened the bottle sound came down the pathway to her bedroom and came through the open window and started making the bottle sound right over the this was a supernatural thing that was happening. It was like a man coming with a bag of bottles right through the window and coming to the bedroom. And uh, my mother shook my father and said, wake up, wake up. And then my father felt hands choking his waist. And uh, he was going to be choked to death. So he cried out in his heart, Jesus, save me. And immediately the hands went away from his neck mm -hmm. and the sound was gone. Mm -hmm. But the next morning, the bruises on his neck from finger marks were still there. So it mm -hmm. was not in that imagination. It was a real event. But the name of mm -hmm. Jesus, and that's the second slide we've got that at the name of Jesus, uh, every knee shall bow. And Satan, Amen. of course, will be able to stop that. And he fears the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, the next yeah. slide talks about the name of Jesus. Okay. Now, I grew up in, in that household where my father had, and mother had faith in, in Jesus and his name. And I learned to respect that name. But then as I moved to Australia uh, to do my work that I was doing, I heard about Ron Wyatt. Now, Ron Wyatt uh, was over in Turkey. Uh, he had heard about this boat shape in the mountains, and so he took his two sons, Danny and Ronnie, across to Turkey, and they went to the place in the mountains of Ararat where uh, this report had been of this, uh, this boat shape in the mountains. And they went across there and they found that it was level with the ground. It was not up above the ground where you could examine it. The shape of the boat was same level as the ground. It looked like if this was a boat, 
it had come down the mountain and then a mud flow had covered up most of it, but the top of it could still be seen as a shape. And they could not uh, test it, they could not examine it. And so Ron Wyatt went back home, he met some friends in America, uh, and they began to pray to the Lord that if this was the Ark of Noah in the mountains, in the same place the Bible says it would be, then the Lord please move the mountain away so that they could be sure and they could examine it better. Now, Jesus did make a promise. He says, uh, if you uh, have enough faith, you can move mountains. So Jonathan, so if I, Jonathan, yes. wasn't that right that he asked about uh, if he wanted to, uh, if uh, um, Ron Wyatt wanted, God, if God wanted Ron Wyatt to do the search on the boat, he had to lift it up, and then it was lifted. Uh, an earthquake came and lifted the boat seven meters up, or something like that. Yes, that's what happened. Uh, actually, on November the the eleventh at, at eleven o'clock in the morning, suddenly the sky turned silver. The blue sky turned silver color, and this was something that made everybody in that part of Turkey furious. And people came out of their houses. People stopped. They're driving their motor cars. They all looked up at the sky, the silver sky. And then when everybody was safely out of their houses uh, and get hurt if the house fell down, they, uh, the earthquake came. And it actually moved the mountain, which in effect is the same as lifting the boat up. And the boat remained above the level of the ground and so Ron flew back to Turkey and uh, they began uh, people who uh, had equipment to test everything and they found there was a pattern a real regular pattern of iron and and straight lines inside uh, the structure but not on the outside so they knew this was indeed a boat. Now, Ron had prayed, if it's Noah's Ark, please move the mountain. And yes, God moved the mountain. That was his answer, Noah's Ark. And so they began to study further. Now, when I heard about this, I was skeptical. Now, but there is a text in the Bible, and that's our next slide. Prove all things. Mm -hmm. When you are not a believer in something, uh, you are required not to attack it, but to test it, prove it. And then if it's right, you hold fast to it. Now, I could have um, uh, attacked it. And so... Um, I was reading uh, an article against it by some Christian people. I thought they were Christians. And they were attacking Ron, saying he was telling lies. And they gave things in their article which seemed to be right. And so I was influenced by them that Ron was probably not telling the truth. But a choice. I could talk against him or I could prove. And so I decided to do what God said, prove all things. And so so besides so beside that, that these people were writing this article, I think you said that you were skeptical at once when you heard it. Uh, why were you skeptical when you had read in the Bible that uh, Noah's Ark was landing on the Ararat Mountains? Was it, uh, why were you skeptical? Because I thought Mount Ararat was the mountain. And do not read the Bible carefully. It doesn't say Mount Ararat. 
In fact, there's good historical evidence that Mount Ararat is a post-flood mountain. It came up after the flood. And uh, the, the, there was no mountain there where Mount Ararat is today. That's a, a, a volcanic mountain that came up and history to giving us the time when it happened. People were living in the area. But the mountains of Ararat to the south, uh, the Bible says the mountains not one mountain on its own, but mountains, like a mountain, and that's exactly what this what this location is. So anyway, because I I was uh, uh, I was reading the Bible wrong, and I was listening to the the uh, the attack by these people, I thought, well, it does not seem right that. And then I heard that. This in this article they said he's claiming to find Sodom and Gomorrah, he's claiming to find the Red Sea crossing, he's claiming to find Mount Sinai. I thought, yes, that's too much for one man to find. So once again that made me more skeptical. But I knew that I had to do the right thing. And so I got his phone number, I telephoned him several times, and then I said, Mr. Wyatt, I'm going over from Australia to America and I want you to show me the evidence uh, and because I was willing to do that the Lord heard my prayer I prayed before I left and I said Lord if you want if this is true I want you to prove it to me and I want to be so certain that there's no doubt so I prayed to him and then I went to meet the man personally and uh, when his wife met me at the airport Mary knelt I was almost ready to say, well, you look like nice people, but um, I'm going to show you that you made a mistake. If you're honest, well, uh, you think it's that. I don't believe it is what I'm going to say against it. Anyway, she said, and we've got many things to show you. So she drove me to a, a house where Ron was showing some footage of his findings at Mount Sinai in Arabia. And I, I pray, Lord, if this is true, make it very straight to me. And within a few minutes, it was almost like a voice coming to me and saying, Jonathan, this is the truth. This, this genuine video footage, he has found this. And I knew then that even though uh, I had objections, I, those objections were not going to so I spent a whole week at his house. And uh, at the end of the week, he said, come with me now to Turkey. I'm going on Sunday. I'm flying to Turkey. Come with me and I'll show you Noah's Ark. And I had spent all my money and I had my airfare booked back to Australia. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but Ron, uh, I cannot come with you. I would love to come, but I can this trip but i determined that i was going anyway and i was going to go personally with uh, others who could help test it with me and uh, so my first trip to turkey i took a man from australia and uh, trevor prestige and uh, we arrived at the little town of dubai about half an hour away from the noah's ark site in the mountains and as we got to the town, uh, I, I knew that there was a danger because everybody was away off the streets and I saw bullet holes in the windows and so on. And uh, so I, uh, before I left Australia, I, I had heard that Ron had been kidnapped at one time by uh, Kurdish guerrillas. Now, Kurds are people who live inside Turkey, but they do not do not have their own homeland. Uh, and this war goes on between the Turks and the Kurds. And uh, so I had got a safe passage visa from the Kurds to Australia, uh, so that when, if I was kidnapped, uh, I could show them this safe passage visa and they would let me go. But if the Turks saw me with that, 
I could be in danger because they would think that I was on the side of the Kurds and I, I could be thrown into prison. Well, I went down to the Valley of Eight in a car, motor car. I hired a car and uh, my friend Trevor and I and the driver, he was a Kurdish driver, uh, we're on our way to the Valley of Eight because because not far away from Noah's Ark, there is a valley called the Valley of Eight named after the eight people who came through the ark. Mm -hmm. And there's a village with that same name. And we were driving there and suddenly the Turkish military stopped us and they arrested us when they saw that this Kurdish man was the driver. So uh, we, uh, we were taken back to the military compound and uh, there uh, there was a danger we were going to be thrown into prison. And so um, to cut the story short, we eventually were released by order of the governor who said that we were not, occurred, not terrorists or anybody against Turkey. We were just archaeologists. And uh, we continued our work and down in the Valley of Eight, uh, my life was threatened again. Uh, the the uh, chief of the Valley of Eight had stolen some things which were sold on the black market in Istanbul. And uh, he discovered that I had found out that he was involved in the smuggling of things and selling of them. So he wanted to kill me. And uh, that's a, another story. I won't go into that now, but the Lord saved my life and we got out safely. But uh, we, we were, could have come to a very nasty end. After Noah's Ark, uh, we've been there several times and, and done our own research and proved beyond any doubt, yes, this is the Ark, no question. Uh, I decided to go down to the Sodom and Gomorrah area in Israel, in the southern desert of Israel. And... Uh, it was an amazing thing. Uh, you, in that desert, you can die of thirst. You can die without water within hours, not days, but hours. And uh, yeah, I'm sure of Gomorrah here. It's a dry desert. Uh, and uh, you must take lots of water with you. And if you don't, uh, you can be dead. And uh, so, you know, the I was yeah. I was thinking about that Jonathan. That when you found when he said that he found Sodoma and Gomorrah. You know, when I was there, there was a sign on the side saying Gomorrah. It was really easy to find. So when they say that, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it's evidence that I mean, even the people living there know that there is Sodoma and there is Gomorrah. Yes, that's very interesting too. Uh, there was no signs when we went down there, but okay. the, the Israeli government now has recognized that this discovery is genuine, it's true. And just like the Turkish government have acknowledged that Noah's Ark is, is what Ron Wyatt found. And uh, the Israeli government have recognized that Sodom and Gomorrah is what Ron Wyatt said I found. Yes, it is true, so they put up a sign. Very very good. Mm -hmm. Now, however, I was convinced when I saw, and I've got a picture there putting up on the screen of, of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and at Gomorrah there you've got the white, the white ashes, the next picture that is, yeah, there you've got the white ash of the buildings and the desert. And uh, when I went there, Everything was ash. All the white is ash. And uh, I was convinced that this was the place. But how do you convince skeptics? All right. Before I took my team back to that place, I prayed to the Lord, Lord, would you please give me evidence that will convince the skeptics? Well, I took a, a group of people 
there and uh, my wife was with me, my wife Josephine, and uh, uh, four or five other people. And in the, we pulled in about nine o'clock at night in between the houses and parked our car. And now in this place, it's so dry, it never rains, that you ever, hardly ever have rain in the desert. And I had been praying for two weeks, Lord, when we get there to Gomorrah, please give us some special evidence that this is the place that the skeptics can see. Well, we stopped the car and uh, I got out of the car and uh, Josephine got out and she had a torch. And she shone the torch between my feet. I don't know why she did that, but God must have impressed her to do it. And there was the evidence. Sulfur balls, balls of brimstone, yeah. sulfur mm -hmm. between Good my sulfur. feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was the evidence that you don't normally see because the, the wind blows the ashes over the sulfur balls and hides it. Uh, but now the rain had come just the night before. It had rained and washed away the ash so that the balls could. And, also, they, uh, were laying, they were laying up, but they were actually laying up on the surface. Yes, they were up on the surface because the, the small layer of ash that comes when the wind blows the ash had now been uh, washed away and the sulfur balls were there all over the place. And so I got some sulfur on a spoon. I, I got a match, set fire to it, and that gave us light to put down our beds for the night to lie on the air. Amen. Now, yeah, another, another wonderful answer to prayer was when I took the same people down to the Red Sea. And that's the next picture of, a, uh, of the story of the, uh, uh, the wheels. Now, Josephine, before she went into the water, uh, had, I mean, we know that wheels had been found, chariot parts had been found, and skeletal parts of horses and of men, and that coral was growing over a lot of this, and that preserved it. Josephine said to the Lord, will you please help me to see something now as I go into the water that will glorify your name? Mm -hmm. Well, within just a few minutes, she was in about 10 feet of water, about three meters of water, and she looked down, and she said, that's coral, but it's not coral. It's the wrong shape. Uh, coral has a special shape when it grows, but this was different shape, but it was still coral. Mm -hmm. And so she dived down and she tried to pull this thing up and it broke in half because it was cemented to a stone, to a rock. So she brought up that half then she dived down and she brought up the, the stone with the other half. And what it was cemented to it was actually a wheel axle, the axle of a wheel. And the part that had broken, we looked at it and it was iron inside the coral. We still have that in our house here. The part of a wheel a, a axle of a wheel, a spoke of a wheel, rather, sorry, a spoke of a wheel, and uh, it's got coral on the outside, dead coral, and on the inside, it's iron, part of an iron. Well, certainly that glorifies God because it, it proves that the event did happen, and this is where it happened and where God opened up the sea to rescue his people. But the most exciting discovery of all is Ark of the Covenant. Now, in this next picture, you'll see the significance and meaning of the Ark of the Covenant. 
God told Moses to build this big box. And uh, this box actually was called, and uh, it's called the Ark of the Covenant because God's covenant, his Ten Commandments, was placed inside it. Now, we have all broken God's law. We are all guilty before God. We must all die because sin cannot be allowed into heaven. And we are all sinners. Hmm. So over the, ark, over the Ten Commandments, there was placed a lid called the mercy seat, showing that God wants to have mercy over us who have broken his law. But that is only possible because of someone who will take our place, someone who will die for us so that we can be rescued from death. Mm -hmm. And so once a year, the blood of sacrifice, a prophecy of Jesus' blood, was sprinkled on the lid, on the mercy seat. So we can be restored to the presence of God only by the blood of Jesus who became our sacrifice and gave us mercy, mercy for we who had broken his law. That story of the Ark of the beautiful gospel story in the Ark. Now, Ron Wyatt was uh, in Jerusalem and he was walking along uh, in front of Skull Hill Golgotha with an antiquities director and they were talking about different things and suddenly Ron's left arm shot out and he pointed to a rubbish dump with a dead cat on it and he said there is Jeremiah's cave and the Ark of the Covenant is in there and what came out of his mouth was a big surprise to him he said, hey, I don't know why I said that. It was not even in my head, but it came out of my mouth. And the antiquities man said, and this was also a miracle, he said, Ron Wyatt, come to my office now. We will give you a permit to start digging. Hmm. Yeah. Something that never happens. Hmm. You have to go through so much trouble to to get permission for things and they don't just offer you like that and you also have to be linked to a university that they approve of and you have to go through so many things to get permission but this was given to ron and uh, for three years ron dug in that area not knowing why he had said those words except that god must have made it happen so it took three years before you actually found Noah's Ark. I mean, uh, the Ark of the yeah. Covenant. The Ark of the yes, Covenant. Yes, that's right, Eva. Yes, three years. And for during those three years, he, he, he was digging, first of all, taking away the rubbish that had built up over thousands of years on that rubbish dump. Uh, then looking here, looking there, digging here, digging there in front of the cliff, and nothing seemed to work. And uh, then uh, two of his, his two sons went home sick. So Ron was just on his own with a little Arab boy who was helping him. And uh, they came inside the cliff to a cave. And Ron said to the little Arab boy who could squeeze through without them having to dig a lot of things unnecessarily, because they were digging away, digging, and nothing was anywhere. Uh, and he said to him, squeeze through, see if you can see anything. Well, that little Arab boy squeezed through into the hole. In a moment, he was out again, and he was frightened. He said, what's in there? What's in there? I do not want to be here anymore. And he never again worked underground only above ground. He was too afraid to come underground then. Well, Ron was curious. He thought, well, if this is so, something here has frightened this boy. I must see it for myself. So he pushed away uh, part of the rock 
and he he pushed himself on his stomach into this other cave and he saw that there was a dry rotted animal skins dry rotted wood and stones over some things that had been put in here in the cave and then he shot on watch and he saw something golden hmm. on now knew where he was he was in a cave where he knew it was the ark of the covenant he instinctively knew and so he went back several times and eventually uh, took pictures didn't he, didn't he faint didn't he faint for a while yes. too, just to remember yes he did he fainted in fact, I was cutting the story short, but you brought out that detail. That's true. He did. He fainted. And it took uh, it took several months before he got evidence. Uh, the Antiquities Department evidence that had found some Solomon's Temple. And so Ron took out something and that, that condemned him. And they told him, don't talk about this to anybody else because they are afraid. Uh, you see, there are Israelis who want to build another temple and they want to build it where the Muslims have their Dome of the Rock. And if that was to happen, there'd be war. The Israeli government does not want war. And so they told him to, uh, to uh, uh, keep quiet about it so there were many things that could not be revealed and this is why some skeptics have said well ron wyatt is just making up the story because he, he won't tell us this and he won't tell us that well ron was honoring the promise to the antiquities department and the israeli government and so they permitted him to continue work now uh, they I continued my work. I, I, I've actually led or accompanied 25 expeditions. And in the, in the course of that, I've um, uh, investigated the Ark of the Covenant as far as it can be uh, assessed. Everything that Ron has said is true. And just before Ron died, he visited our home here in New Zealand mm -hmm. and to me, he said, when the next visit to New to uh, Jerusalem, I want you to come and I want you to come into the cave with me and I want to be a backup evidence that what I'm saying is true. Mm -hmm. He was prepared to take me into the Ark of the Covenant cave and show it, show it to me. Well, I thought, God, you may not want me to go in, but if you want me to go, I will go. And Ron says, well, do not, uh, do not ask me why. When I get to Jerusalem, I'll phone you and I'll say, Jonathan, come. And that's all I'm going to say <laughs> on the phone because I don't want anyone mm -hmm. to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We could be attacked. Mm -hmm. And he said, when I, when, uh, I say, come, you just a plane, you fly to Jerusalem and join me. And this is where we're going, into the cave. Well, a number of things happened in connection with the Ark of the Covenant. And we were living in, a, in a, a Australia at first. We moved to New Zealand later. And uh, we got a strong impression that we had to write a book on the Ark of the Covenant to tell the whole story because this is a message of salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not want to write a book. I was, I was so busy already. I didn't have the time really. Interesting thing is, and uh, on the, the next picture, we're going to, uh, we'll show the, uh, the, the text that the Bible uses. There's the Ark actually, as you see it there. And, and, and that text is the one that just flashed up for a moment then. Before they call, I will run, and while they're yet speaking, I will hear. Let me tell you something. For 
For quite a long time, although I did not want to write a book, for quite a long time I had been writing articles about various aspects with the Ark of the Covenant, and I had no use for those articles. I didn't know how I was going to use them, but Josephine kept asking me, you're writing another article. Why are you doing it? I says, well, I do not know why I'm, I'm doing it. But I feel that I have to do this. And I kept writing these articles and not knowing what or how they were going to be used. So there were jobs that I was doing and I didn't know why I was doing them. Okay. Then came the impression, write the book. And this was not my choice. It was just as though God was speaking and saying, you, a book must be written. You please write that book. So suddenly, all these articles I'd been writing had a meaning. Here were chapters for the book already pre-written, and I did not know why I Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> and do you know I can no credit for that book Josephine and I did not write that book we were simply the pen in God's hand it was his job not ours he charge it was his book not ours we can take no credit for it let me tell you this that eating together of that book almost every chapter was a miracle let me illustrate. The man who gave Jesus his own new tomb when Jesus was crucified was Joseph of Arimathea. And he was a member of the Jewish council, the Jewish Sanhedrin. And Joseph actually was a secret follower of Jesus. And uh, he decided to give Jesus an honourable burial. The Jewish Sanhedrin wanted Jesus' body to be thrown on the rubbish dump and burnt with the other two criminals. But Joseph changed their plans. He gave Jesus a decent burial. So Joseph would be looking pretty bad in the eyes of the Jewish Sanhedrin. They would be very angry with him. Instead of Jesus being forgotten by being thrown on the rubbish dump and no one would remember him anymore, Jesus was a man in the eyes of the, of the people of Jerusalem. He had been unjustly, uh, unjustly crucified, uh, and Joseph was a man who was well known, respected in Jerusalem. He was one of the wealthiest people in the country. So Joseph was a marked man. The Sanhedrin now hated him. What would become of Joseph? What would happen to him? The Bible does not tell us. The Bible story stops. But the, the life of Joseph still went on. So what happened to him? And that question rose in my mind as I was writing the book. The people are going to ask what happened to Joseph. And so I do not know. I did not know. And yet it, that's something that should go to complete the story. So Josephine and I got down on our knees on this morning and we said, Lord, you are in charge of this project. Would you please give us the information that must go in the book as to what happened to Joseph of Arimathea? Please, would you give it, us that information? Well, that very day, we had to go shopping in Adelaide, South Australia. As we, I was praying in my heart, Lord, I need information of Joseph. Because today is the day this chapter has to be written. We got to town. I went to the post office box. And there was a parcel that had been posted two weeks earlier in Britain. And the man's name was Arthur Edel. 
And he sent a little letter with this. Uh, he said, Jonathan, I do not know if this information will be useful for any purpose for you, but for the last 20 years, I have been researching all the documents from the first century about Joseph of Arimathea. And here is the information I'm sending to you now. Yeah, now, you said two amen. Weeks, two weeks before we called, God prompted him to post it to us so it would arrive the very day we prayed. Mm, amen. Before they called, God mm, answered. Yes. Yes. Hmm. And yeah. then on, Ron, on Ron's last visit into the cave, Ron's last visit into the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, he went in and there were four young men guarding the Ark. Now, Ron knew that nobody ever dared go in there. Who were these four young men? And one of them said to Ron, uh, and by the way, all the had been removed, all the dry rotted animal skins had been removed, uh, all of the, the timber had been removed, and all of the uh, items in the cave were now visible. There was the, uh, the uh, table of showbread, there was the, the ark, uh, there, there was the altar of incense, there was the seven branch lampstand, and there was the ark of the and they had all been repositioned into the same hmm. relationship that they were in the old tabernacle. Hmm. And uh, here behind the was a rainbow moving, all different colors, all moving behind on the wall. And the four young men spoke, one of them spoke to Ron. He said, here, Ron stood there shocked he didn't know what to think and one young man said to him come here and two of the men lifted up the mercy seat with the angels and this other young man said put in your hands lift out the ten commandments and put them on that ledge on that at the proper time these are going to come and shock the world. Hmm. Ron just stood there. He said, go on, put it there, pick it up, put it there. And Ron was, was really transfixed, he didn't know what to think. And then one of the angels, one of the young men said, go and get a camera and you can photograph all this and put that on the same shelf. That's going to be seen by the world later. Well, I thought this was an important part of the story. So this had to go in, in the Ark of the Covenant book. I did not know uh, how to write it and how to put it in because this could lead to a lot of people to be skeptics uh, that we're making up the story. So I said, we got down on our knees this day. This had now come the time in the book where this had to go in. Lord, can you please give us back up evidence, further witnesses, so this can be true. And so we prayed that morning. And you know what? In about an hour after that, I got a phone call from a lady in Queensland. Her name was Vader Cum Ewan. She ran three. And she said, Jonathan, I do not know if you, if you are interested in this, but my husband has just been reading, my husband Daryl has just been reading from the Spirit of Prophecy a statement which says that every time the ark was being Transferred, there were four angels who guarded it. Hmm. Oh. Half way to another man, Dennis Stanley. He didn't know about Vader Come Ewan's call. He didn't know her. He said, Jonathan, I have to phone you. Do you know what? Sister White says that 
and 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 and, she, and later come you and gave the name of the book and the reference. Now Dennis Stanley said, Sister White says that there were four angels guarding the ark when it was moved, and he gave a different book, but back up evidence. So here, the only time ever in my life anybody has rung me about that subject, two people rang me within half an hour after we had prayed. And before they call, I will answer. God had these two people reading two different books and ready to phone me that morning when we prayed. Amen. So here we've got four young men who are four angels. Okay. Uh, now, let, let me tell you one other story. In December, as the book was coming to a close and it was it was uh, just about ready to, uh, to be finished, Josephine asked me, when is this book going to be finished? And I said, well, I hope it will be finished. This was in December. I hope it will be. I think it's going to be finished by the end of February. So uh, as February went on, as February, she said to me, no, she said, I'm going to ask God. <laughs> you think you can do it by the end of February? I'm going to ask God when his book finished. And so she prayed. The next morning, she said, I, I've got the date. Do you know what happened? During the night, she had a dream. And the, and the only part of the dream had anything else in it, but the, the date was April 18. Mm -hmm. wow. And she knew that this was God's answer to her prayer. That her dream, and nothing was in the dream except that date, mm. April 18. Mm. So I said to her, um, what makes you think it's going to be April 18? Because I want it to be finished faster than that. She said, well, I believe God told me. And gave me. Well, as we got closer, the book was finished about the middle of April. And I go to Africa to speak, to Zimbabwe, to, to take some evangelistic uh, subjects at a church camp. And uh, we lived two hours away from the airport, or one hour, one hour return journey, two hours. And so I was on my way, got to the airport to catch the plane, and I had uh, travelled about 200 times around different places around the world on, by aeroplane. I'd never had any trouble with my passport. But when I got to the airport this morning, I had forgotten to bring my passport. And mm -hmm. to go home and get it was a two-hour return journey. And by then, the plane would be gone. I'd miss the plane. So I came home, I, I had I cancelled that. I'd never had to do this in my life before. I'd ne never had my passport before. But today, it was forgotten. So I travelled a two-hour journey to get my passport, and there it was in my office at the place I always did. And Josephine said to me, You must go to the. You have not finished the, 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 the. You have not finished the cover. She said we've been having trouble with the cover because the person that we've been using has made it too dark, or he's made it too light. He hasn't made it right. And uh, I said, well, I've got somebody looking after that now who can fix that up while I'm away. And Josephine said, no, it's our job. We've, we've got to do this. And uh, so she said, where is the place that does the cover? And I said, it's the same block, city block, where uh, I booked my air airfare. And so I went back to Adelaide. I went to rebook the airfare to get on a different plane. And uh, so I then went round the corner to the place that had the uh, the job of fixing the cover, 
of the book. And I found that he had done it wrong. So I spent 40 minutes with him, helping him to do it right. And then I was ready to go on the plane. Mm -hmm. Do you know, you know that God knew that the, the cover was right. And he okay. made sure that I left my passport at home and was delayed so that I could check on it. And that, mm -hmm. and you know what the date was? It was April 18. <laughs> the Lord knows. Isn't, yeah. Isn't God amazing? Amen. You know, Amen. And, and as the next picture shows, um, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was told, and the next picture shows that, this time next year, God gave a time I will establish with Isaac, which Sarah bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So God actually can make times for things, and we, uh, we don't realize that God is working through everything. And so I was on my way to Africa. God said, no, you're not going to Africa because you've got a job to do to finish the book today on the cover. And uh, I am picking the date. I'm giving you the job of, of missing your plane so that this date that I have picked, the hmm. book will be finished fully. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's important, wonderful. you know, when that's important, Jonathan, when uh, things doesn't seem to go over way that we just trust, okay, Lord, you have another plan, and then you can see afterwards why he stopped things. Yes, that's right. It's looking back afterwards, as you say, is when we realize that uh, God was in the, my mistake of, of forgetting my passport when I never, ever in 200 flights ever left, left it behind. But this day it had to be left behind because God had that date set to finish the book. Right. Hmm. Absolutely amazing. And we didn't have the money to publish the book. I mean, he, he gave us the job. Of, it was his, his job, not ours. But we did not have the money to publish the book. And uh, so the next step gives a, a promise from God, what he's going to do. God suddenly provided the money. Oh, that there's miracle stories attached to the money. My God shall supply all your need. That's what the next text says. Mm -hmm. And God does it. Yes, he knows how. Now, once the book was finished, Satan was... I was giving a lecture at a little called Emerald in Queensland, Australia. And a family came, they travelled three hours just to come to a one-hour lecture and another three hour journey back home. And at the lecture, they picked up a copy of Ark of the Covenant, the same book, and took it home with them. And uh, when the father was uh, uh, at work and the little six year old was at school, the mother decided that she would pick up the book and reading it. As soon as she picked up the book to start reading, she felt a tug against her as though somebody was pulling it out of her hand. And then a gruff voice said, Ma, you do not want to do this. This is bad information. You don't want this rubbish. Hmm. And picked the book out of her hands and threw it across the room. Now she saw nobody. But somebody that she could not see was pulling out of her hands and throwing it away. Well, she was shocked and shaken. She eventually walked over the room, picked up the book and put it on the shelf and thought, I will wait till my husband comes home and tell him what happened. And then as she stood at the sink washing the dishes that night, Somebody picked her up by the way, picked her up, lifted her up toward the ceiling and threw her across the room just where they, he threw the book. And then she felt hands choking her. 
just like my father did before. Hmm. And she wanted to say, Lord Jesus, help me. But she, nothing could come out of her mouth. And then she felt hand pulling her tongue out of her mouth. But her little year old girl had been well trained by her parents. And that little girl, only six years old, shouted out. She saw what was happening. She shouted out. And she said, Satan, let go of my mummy. In the name of Jesus, let my mummy go. Mm -hmm. The name of Jesus. And Satan let go. But that shows what Satan thinks about the Ark of the Covenant discovery in the book. 